we're creating about as many jobs as those other metros combined. So Bend hates to be compared to Boulder. We could have a whole hour conversation about this. I think it sets us up another kind of foundation. You know, it's pretty forward thinking, you know, developments for an old busted up sawmill town. These conversations are brought to you by the Lad Group, Ben's leading real estate team. Help continue this Ben Beat conversation by subscribing, sharing, and leaving us a review. I'm here with Heidi Wright, who is the new publisher of the Ben Bulletin. I've had a couple great interviews recently, and every single one of them mentioned that I need to have you in here to have a conversation. They're all excited about the future, so um, I couldn't be more pleased you're here today. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Well, good. Well, this is, you know, it's... This is an exciting time for Bend. You know, a lot of great things have been happening, but um, one of the biggest things that happened recently was the EO Media's acquisition of the Ben Bulletin. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ben Bulletin's been kind of on the edge for a couple of years. And uh, there's a lot of business leaders in this town that are very excited about the future role. And I, I would just like to unpack that a little bit here today. Okay. Um, so, but before we get to that, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. What's your history? How did you end up in Bend? You've been here before, right? And, yes. And you've been in, in the whole kind of Central Oregon or Oregon for a while now, right? Mm -hmm. And I have. Uh, so, I'd love to hear kind of your origin story and and why mm -hmm. we're sitting, you know, here together today. Okay. Well, I did come to Oregon in 2004. Okay. I was with the newspaper with Lee Enterprises, which is a publicly traded company in Montana, and when and Pioneer News Group, who owns Klamath Falls, um, approached me, or I, I knew the CEO of the company, we began a conversation about the possibility of coming to Klamath Falls and working in their Oregon property, their only Oregon property, um, as a part equity owner and uh, being able to work for a privately held family company yeah. in newspapers. And I thought that sounded very attractive. So I moved from Montana to Klamath Falls in 2004 and was with them for 10 years as president and publisher of Klamath Publishing, which owned the Herald News and then a small little paper out in Lakeview, Lake County Examiner. Okay. And a few other, you know, yeah. shopper products, things that newspapers own. Yeah. So, and then in 2014, uh, I knew Gordon Black from just being involved in in our industry in the state, I was on the Oregon Newspaper Publishers Association board and then served uh, through the chairs of that organization. So you get to know a lot of the yeah. other folks around the state in our industry, got yeah. to know Gordon. And then when um, the opportunity came up with his CFO retiring in 2004, I, or in 2014, sorry, okay. uh, I came on board actually five years ago yesterday, uh, November 4th. So I started at the bulletin okay. five years ago and my first day on the job, I, uh, got out of the car, realized I didn't bring my boots with me and it was about nine inches of snow on the ground. So <laughs> I, took to a, <laughs> I took a picture of my foot and uh, of my, you know, my high heel in the snow to my husband, sent it to my husband. I said, bring my boots, <laughs> please, <laughs> this weekend and my winter coat. Yeah. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, that was my, my first day on the job in Bend five years ago. And then the uh, opportunity opened up with EO Media Group yep. about two and a half years later um, to be their chief operating officer. Oh, Again, wow. coming back into a family held company the, yeah. in the lead role because uh, the CEO of the company uh, was retired and uh, still my boss, the CEO of EO Media Group is yeah. Steve Forrester. It's okay. our family members. And so anyway, I... Uh, you know, I went to Salem and went to work in their corporate offices. And um, as it turned out, then ended up now back in Bend. Are you excited to be here? I'm very excited to be here. Very excited for this opportunity and overwhelmed with the community support. Well, yeah, the, what's what's exciting is, is with all these business leaders and community leaders that I'm talking to, every single one of them have mentioned how excited they are for the bulletin. Mm -hmm. and, and where it's going. Ben Bolton started in what, 1905, something like that, or? I believe so, yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so we're well over 100 years now. Which for, most newspapers are. I mean, yeah. that is not uncommon. That yeah. is the backbone of of the society for, you know, being the, the voice for a community. So it's newspapers, and most of them in the country are over 100 years old. 
Well, it's it's good to see that it's going forward as well because over the last number of years, with you know some of the reports that I was reading on the bulletin, it was it was it was troubled, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, to have have you guys step in, um, and and more importantly, to have a you know a, a, a local company that understands mm-hmm. Oregon and and, yeah. and and Bend is, I think, the ultimate solution, right? Yeah, I think that was one of the most important things. Um, that we were hearing from the community members when we started talking to people about, you know, well, first of all, our company started talking internally with our board, with our family members who I work for, you know, the first question was, can we do this? And then the second question is, should we do this? And and in uh, answering that second question, talking to the community members here and seeing how passionate they were about the bulletin and about keeping an Oregon based structure yeah. to the newspaper rather than it being an out of state. And, and they trusted us from the standpoint that we weren't going to do what the venture capitalists are doing with other newspapers in the country and, you know, and trying to you know, monetize it as quickly as possible. I think, you know, our strategy, my strategy is we need to evolve, yeah. not retreat. And the yeah. retreat is what's going on in the industry right now. Retreating, of course, we got to cut costs. We got to do things smarter, but yeah. uh, not at the expense of taking reporters off the streets or um, you know building up our advertising revenue because that's what's going to take to make a sustainable model. You've got to have both. You've got to have the the reporting and the ability to interact and connect with the community. And then we've got to be effective at delivering eyeballs to our advertisers. Brian Ladd here. I hope you're enjoying the conversation and find this dialogue relevant to really what it means to live and work and play in this amazing community. As Ben's leading real estate team, we take our role seriously in representing both buyers and sellers at the absolute highest standards of our industry. For more information on how we can help, feel free to visit our website at benpropertysource.com or text LAD1, L-A-D-D-1 to 88000. What do you see the role of, of the bulletin for the community? You know, how would you define your, you know, your primary purpose? Well, I think we need to be a mirror. A mirror. Okay. The community. We need, I, and some and that's not a, a unique phrase that I've come up with. I, I heard that recently and I thought it, it makes a lot of sense. So we have to hold a mirror up to the community. And that means we're not the, the chamber newsletter. You know, we, yeah. we will report the news. We have to be. My mantra is we have to be credible, we have to be relevant, and we have to reflect our community. If we do that, if we do those three things well, we will, we will serve our advertisers well, we will serve our owners well, and we'll have a sustainable business model. Yeah. So I think that's, and, and you know, what I heard loud and clear when I came back and was talking to, you know, the investors and citizens and readers uh, is that, you know, we need to be connected into the community. We need to not be the bulletin, which was a phrase I heard more than once. Yeah. And we need to get out and reach out into the community. And I think I think we're doing that. I'm getting good feedback that yeah. people feel like we are getting involved. Yeah. And we're learning what's going on. We're, you know, as as Catherine Brown, one of our owners of the company, said to me, you know, because there was a lot of question, you know, are we, are we going to be a left-leaning liberal paper? Are we going to be conservative? There was, you know, there was some view that the paper, the bulletin was somewhat more conservative than mm-hmm. maybe reflective of the compu- the community. And that's back to, we need to reflect the community. Well, you know, and Catherine's response to that was, you know, I'd rather not lean left or lean right. I'd rather lean in the center and yeah. with both of my ears <clears throat> open. And, and I think that is definitely a path for our company going forward. And that's what the community uh, will be best served with, I think. Can you take that nationwide, please? <laughs> I wish. Yeah, I think we're becoming so polarized in the country. It's, it's disturbing that in, in particular when um, media is being um, considered an enemy. That's, yeah. And some media, left and right, is feeding into that. Well, they're using it. They're, there's an agenda behind the media. It's a weapon. Yeah. And uh, we should never 
journalism should never be a weapon. Yeah. Well, and what you're referring to about probably some of the sentiments that people have had about the bulletin uh, in the past was that it, sometimes it did have a bit of an, an agenda and it, it didn't mm-hmm. feel like it was appreciative of a little bit of of all the great things that were truly happening in this town. Mm-hmm. And and I think you're right. It doesn't need an agenda. There's there's an amazing storyline here. There's there hundreds is. of nonprofits doing amazing things. There's mm-hmm. hardworking city planners trying to to do things that frankly aren't being done well anywhere and and we're doing a pretty darn good job at them Mm -hmm. and there's citizens planning you know 30 years in in the future with the 2050 plan Mm -hmm. and so i mean i it it seems like the subject matter if if you're just a mirror is a pretty dynamic and interesting one at that it is and you know we we need to be the mirror but we also need to take a leadership role as well yeah and and you know offer our opinions our opinion page is an opinion page. Yep. It doesn't color the rest of the coverage in the paper. Some people may feel that that's not possible. I think newspapers create a little bit of an odd dynamic for themselves, you know, if they do choose to step up in a leadership role, especially yep. with political endorsements. Yeah. It whether it's right or wrong, you know, it, it creates some potential discourse with the rest of the content in the paper that's unintended yeah so we just have to be aware of that and but again it's it's more um you know it's more of trying to reflect the community and most importantly be credible yeah and we don't always get it right and we don't want to be you know we we want to be able to correct mistakes if we made a reporting error you yeah know, i i think one of the things we're more open with the community right now. And I give a lot of credit to the editor who we've brought on board, Jerry O'Brien. Okay. He, he has that right tone. He has that right balance. Yeah. Um, we will do our job as journalists and we, you know, we aren't for sale. Our content is not for sale and, you know, not everything that happens in Bend, Oregon or central Oregon is going to be, chamber news that you're going to want the rest of the world to hear about but it is part of our responsibilities so yeah you know we have to be credible but we also have to be um, a part of the community not aside from the community yeah observing it well those are all great things when did when did jerry start his his uh, the, the role as the new editor um well, I asked him uh, to consider it uh, about an hour after we were the successful bidders okay. out of the bankruptcy auction on July 29th. And so I believe he started mid-September, if I okay. remember correctly. I should know that um, immediately, mid to end of September. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's been noticeable. I mean, yes. I, just even as a reader, I've noticed that... Uh, kind of the level of the discourse and the sophistication of of the discourse in the paper over the last few months has been refreshingly high and professional and it's it's been interesting and what i also really enjoy is and we should talk about this it being owned by eo media which already has all these other uh, journalists all across the state what i'm seeing is a lot more oregon statewide content Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, we're not just a bubble, you know, we're out here kind of in the middle of nowhere in central Oregon, Mm -hmm. but what I feel more connected to the rest of the state over the last few months than I have in a long time. That is great to hear because that is exactly the experience we want you to have. So yes, Bend, you know, we need to report on Bend, but the fact is there is more to this state than Bend or central Oregon. And we are in a unique position to do that. Uh, especially with the ag community, and I think that's an important yeah. um, that's an important topic, agriculture that needs to be um, uh, shared throughout the state, and yeah. we have started doing that as well. So that that is one of the 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 keys to our strategy as a company. We're getting all of our editors together next week, actually, for the first time to talk about in particular, sharing content across the state. The other thing you may notice is we've entered a sharing agreement with OPB. So they have a lot of reporting horsepower in the state too. And that that is part of, of the model is partnerships we and sharing content. So yes, you will see a lot more 
of our Eastern Oregon coverage. And, you know, we've moved up. Jerry's already started changing up the format of the paper. You may notice now page two and page three either have more local news. The front page always has local news, yep. quite a bit of it. I'd say at least four stories a day is yeah. our target. And then the page two and page three, we've we've moved a lot of, it, of that state coverage that you referenced up there. And that may be coverage that we've produced in one of our 14 newspapers yeah. in the region, or it might be something that Oregon Public Broadcasting has produced, yep. or it might be something that we picked up um, through a sharing service with one of the other yeah. papers in the region. But that's our goal is, you know, what do the readers here uh, want to want to know about, you know, and, and Steve Forrester, our CEO, and uh, one of, you know, obviously one of our owners has said, you know, his goal is for the Bulletin and Central Oregon to be a beacon. And this is a this is a game changing acquisition for our company because we don't own any other daily newspapers. Okay. Um, so this is more than double the size of our company okay. in one fell swoop. Yeah. And so we see that, you know, putting uh, a lot of resource and time and focus into growing the bulletin will will also g- be shared out to the rest of the state as well. So we see this more as a as a beacon for the rest of our company and for the rest of the readers in the state. So you're seeing content coming in. Those readers out there are seeing content coming into them out of here as well. So Well, it feels like a really good size for what you're trying to do. It is. And then, you know, our our big publication besides the bulletin now yep. is Capital Press, which is our ag-based publication and that is very focused on uh, agriculture in the northwest well in the region actually we cover california as well so uh, that's you know that's been an important piece to this as well so besides geographically we also can dig deep in in that particular area as far as the economy so seems like you know agriculture is probably it's not it hasn't been leading in the headlines and and there's a lot of amazing job growth that's happened in the area, but you're right. I mean, their voice has not been heard mm-hmm. through this as, as especially as Ben specifically has redeveloped into what it is today. Mm-hmm. And uh, that'll be interesting to, to see that re-elevated. It is interesting when we were looking at just who our readers are of Capital Press. You yeah. know, of course, we've broken it down by zip code and you know, now owning the bulletin, we're looking at strategies, you know, to where, you know, how do, how do we, make sense of this um, for ad buys and other factors for Central Oregon. So yep. it caused me to look at, you know, how many Capital Press subscribers do we have in Central Oregon? And we have actually 4,200 yep. Capital Press subscribers in this area. So yep. we do have an audience that's already seeing the the full meal deal with all of our ag yep. uh, content. But we do, we do find a way that we're going to be able to share that back into our other newspapers that maybe the non ag readers get a little more exposure to the ag world. And we've also developed a magazine that we're excited about called Two, the other Oregon. It's a voice for rural Oregon, Oregon targeted to urban decision makers. And so we, we bring that out once a quarter and it's uh, mailed free to 5,000 people that we've determined are urban decision makers that could probably benefit from understanding more about rural Oregon. So incredible. Not quite sure how we're going to mix that all in with Ben, because as we were talking early on, Catherine Brown asked me, she said, well, does Ben consider itself rural? I said, no, I don't think so. Well, is it urban? That's a good question. How do you, what do you think? Do you think, how would you define band? Is it rural or urban or? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure how to answer that. (laughs) I mean, what's, we are very urban in a rural environment. And, and I think that, that, I mean, I I wish I could come up with a better answer on that, but I think it goes back to the Oregon land use laws, right? Mm -hmm. And those laws that were put in place in the early seventies, which were pretty forward thinking. And the the reason we're not a sprawling Western town with endless congestion and low density subdivisions and lack of connectivity and, um, and a non-diverse job base had to do with these land use laws, which puts these urban growth boundaries around all of our cities. And they want a very 
defined, definitive interface between urban and rural. And I think that's what I love so much about this area is that, you know, if I, if I go up to Montana or if I go to Wyoming or mm-hmm. I go to Idaho, you start knowing when you approach these towns 15 miles out. It's, you know, all the, the counties have, have approved all this low density sprawl. They can't possibly provide infrastructure for it. So there's endless, some paved roads, some dirt roads, some have overhead power, some have underground. A lot of them are on their own private little utilities. And and it's just this endless sprawl as you, you come into the town. Um, but yet their population is no higher than ours. What's interesting here is that, you know, to, to grow, you know, I think the last urban growth boundary expansion of Ben took, what, 15 years to get passed. And we finally did in 2016. Yeah, I believe yeah. 2016. Right. And they had to go back to the state. They were remanded by the state a couple of times to revise that plan. And what's interesting is, is that we live in this this little world here where in a couple square miles, we have this this dense somewhat urban lifestyle where we, we now have a four year university. We have endless amounts of restaurants. Mm-hmm. We have, you know, all these parks and, and fine dining and um, food cart lots and, and, and schools and magnet schools and all this. And then we hit a hard boundary and we have two and a half million acres of forest service at our back door. Mm-hmm. And, um, which is another attraction. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. is, which is incredible. And, and I think that is, I, I would love to be able to come up with a term to describe that, <laughs> um, but it's pretty unique. Mm-hmm. I haven't found that in many other towns where it's this hard, you know, and, I, and, and granted, there are some challenges with that. When you create these urban growth boundaries, it doesn't allow endless housing, and then you have more affordable housing issues. And, and Which is a big, big well, issue. And then you get, you get into the fights on infill. Yep. And, and Not in my backyard. Yep, rezoning, and you know, yep. I know the casitas were a hot topic when i was here before and i think they probably still are a hot topic yeah so how do you make that work how do you how do you make us not become another portland correct um, that is so unaffordable which is just a microcosm what's going on in the bay area and seattle yeah so i gotta tell you it's it's been a struggle for us we um we try to hire people you know and the wages you have to hire at for somebody to move here and find a house and you know settle down have a family yeah it doesn't mesh yeah so we've made two job offers in the last week that people accepted and then turned down because of they couldn't find housing couldn't find a house yeah yep. so i've i've told my management team you know frankly first questions out if you're doing a phone interview is, well, ideally, are you relocating to Bend anyway? Yeah. And because you've got, you're a, that's what's turned out. We've got two people coming in because they're a trailing spouse. Yeah. And their spouse got a job here. Yeah. And so we're able to hire yeah. um, the trailing spouse. And yeah. that's about the only way, I think, you know, unless you've got somebody that had, that, wants to live in an apartment doesn't have a family yep that might be tough too yeah it's overwhelming yeah Uh, as an employer it's very difficult and you know i we employ people uh across the spectrum you know we have four-year degree journalists and highly skilled sales staff and digital team and you know on that end and then we also we we hire you know we have office workers we have people who work for us in our mailroom facility putting the paper together at night um you know to highly skilled pressmen you know so we run the whole gamut as far as the employment spectrum and i I think we're probably just representative of what most businesses in town deal with yeah good luck trying to get people to come from the outside they want to live here they love it yeah they want to go skiing in the winter time um they want to go mountain biking they want to live this lifestyle but they can't afford it yeah well and that's and that's going to be one of the cruxes i think that we as a town need to solve and and a lot of towns do um you know kind of placate to that and say they're picking around the edges or they're fixing affordable housing but they're really picking around the edges i think we're going to need to 
face that head on mm -hmm. because, you know, for the last three years, we, by the, we were named by the Milken Institute as the number one job growth small metro area in the U.S. Yes. And with that type of growth, you need all the, the, the other things that come with that housing, uh, you know, child primarily care. housing, child care, child care, new schools. I think, you know, Ben stands at, you know, we've opened a new school every single year for the last, what, 20 years, which is amazing. I mean, how many towns can say that they've they opened don't. a brand new school every year for the last 20 years? I mean, it's, it's insane. And we're still oversubscribed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I think that's going to need to be something that we continually pick away at or, you know, face head on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's going to be, it's going to impede our, our growth into the future. Yeah. We better be talking about it. Yep. And that's why I'm excited about the bin 2030, now yep. bin 2050. Yeah. And, you know, they're, you know, it's not just that it's, it's the whole yeah. community talking about the future. And, you know, one of the first groups I met when I came here was the looking forward group. Yeah. And what I was impressed by with them is it wasn't just a lot of the newcomers, um, you know, the tech people. And it wasn't just it wasn't all the the old timers who have been here forever and, yeah. you know, want to try to control the future. Yeah. Uh, maybe or in angst about how things look to them. Yeah. It's that it's those groups together, um, you know, people talking, you know, together that in other communities might not be talking to that they might be, but yeah, probably they're not, you know, probably they're not making the effort to yeah. come together and, you know, come up with ideas and conversation. Cause I think that's one of the things in our country that we could do a whole lot more of and and be a lot further ahead is just have more uh, civil discourse yep. and more conversation about about the issues instead of become you know in our own echo chambers we are you know as, as a society i think in the and in towns when you're trying to plan the future of a town um you know you can get into your own echo chamber Absolutely. with everybody that thinks like you and you know you don't want to get outside of that and be challenged or challenge others and i that's one of the unique things I see with, with Bend, you know, I don't mean, you know, it's all just wonderful and everybody gets along great and they're able to have, you know, robust conversations of, of course not, but I do see more of that yeah. capability here than, um, you would think a town this size um, yeah. would be able to, to do. Well, in all the, yeah, in all the conversations that I've had, collaboration has naturally floated into yeah. the conversation without me forcing it in any way. And I think collaboration is is getting to the heart of what you're talking about because Bend is going to continue to grow. Yeah. We have an incredible amount of natural resources. It's beautiful. We now have a one of the most diverse job bases in a hundred thousand person town anywhere in the U.S. Probably anywhere in the world. Um, which and, might help with the next recession. Yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited about that. I was talking to Roger Lee and, you know, we were very heavily dependent on tourism and construction prior mm -hmm. to the last, you know, during the last run up, early 2000s. And, and when the economy took a hit, you know, our, we tumbled. And mm -hmm. um, but it's a very different world we're in now. You know, the, the amount of uh, jobs that they've created in over 50 different sectors in this town is is noteworthy. And, and now the tables have turned and, you know, they're they're trying to get Roger Lee and all the people from Ben to go around the U.S. to teach other towns how to create a diverse economy. And I'm hoping that that'll help um, cr create some resistance to, uh, you know, any economic challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. And I and I think it's also going to play into a lot of different things. I think last time when it hit that hard and um, there was a lot of people, especially in the lower rungs of the income, you know, ladder that were dramatically affected. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can help provide some, um, you know, resistance or, you know, some security in the, in the next downturn. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think we're there, but we'll, we'll you know, the proof's going to be in the future here. I think those uh, lower income earners are going to get hit harder than anybody, you know, regardless of how diverse the economy is. Sure. But if you can mitigate it some, that's, you know, I think that's that's the best path forward is yeah. try to mitigate uh, the impacts of a recession. I've lived through that a couple of times. Yeah. And it, it is devastating to a community and it's, and, you know, what's devastating to the uh, affluent community is, it's tragic for the 
the other side of that, you know, the lower income earners, where they really feel it. Well, they feel it. And then the town feels it too, because it, it doesn't, you know, just when the economy comes back, the, those, those wounds are not healed overnight mm -hmm. because one of the challenges that I hear from builders and developers in our town is I would love to be able to do more affordable housing, but we don't have enough labor here to right. do it. And what, when, and when I studied it is what I saw is that during the last recession, there weren't enough jobs to keep people here. Right. So, so everyone left. left. Well, the trades. The trades the left. The trades all left. And when Good the trades leave, back. you can't get them back. You can't get them back. It, exactly. You know, it took us 20, 30 years to develop that trade pool. Mm -hmm. And now we have this demand for housing that we can't keep up with. So what it's doing is, is it's driving prices up even further. Mm -hmm. And and it's and, and so that, you know, that speaks to what you were just talking about. Right. So you better have a more diverse economy, like yep. you said, so you don't take such a dive when a recession hits so you can keep the trades going. Yeah. And, and not be, but then on the other side of it, you know, why Bend felt that recession so hard was because it, its main industry was, was the real estate. Sure. You know, and that, so it's kind of a vicious cycle, but you talk about the, the, the trades and, and what happens when that falls apart, you know, and the relationships that go away, the workers that go away, it makes me think about you know what we're feeling right now with the trade wars that are going on with in especially like for our capital press publication you know the trade wars are affecting the the uh, folks who re rely on the agricultural yeah. world and when those trade relationships get broke and those trading partners move to other countries for their commodities yeah. Good luck. It's the same thing. Good luck getting them back. Yeah. You know, you've closed those doors much like we closed the doors here uh, when all of the workers, the yeah. skilled workers that can provide the trade for the, you know, building out the economy, you know, when they leave, you aren't going to get them back. And that's the same thing that's happening, I think, on the world stage with with our ag situation. Yeah. You know, we see it in the ag side okay. you know, because we see the equipment dealers who, you know, are hesitant and the farmers are hesitant to buy the equipment because they don't know if they're going to be able to sell their crops. And so the equipment dealers aren't sure, you know, what they should be doing for marketing their products. Yep. And so it just it has a spiral effect, much like what happened here with the with the trade workers leaving. Well, I think th this this gets to the very heart of why the, the bulletin so important for our community. Because if you can, because you're you're the you're the the beacon, you're the light for telling these stories, and bringing everyone around the table to have these discussions, and I think that that's gonna, you know, help us avoid some of this in the future. I mean, even what you're talking about of bridging the kind of our urban bend with the agricultural world of you know our surroundings, I think can go a long ways. And if people don't, if if they have a voice in the conversation, mm -hmm. they they're gonna feel like they're going to be part of the solution yeah. as well <laughs> right exactly well i i wouldn't presume that we would be you know at the head of the table certainly yeah. but we should be at the table yeah. helping facilitate those conversations and and helping uh interpret you know for a readership yeah you know because we do have a large audience um in the community and we also have some reach like into the state capitol yes yeah. we've got a real strong partnership there where we do staff a capitol bureau reporting team in partnership with pamplin media and the salem reporters so you know i think on all of those fronts you know we don't again we shouldn't be at the head of the table we never would presume to be at the head of the table that's not our role but we certainly should be at the table helping facilitate that conversation well, yeah, this this speaks to the collaboration because, you know, in conversations I had with Roger Lee, he said the same thing. He goes, we're at the table, but we're never alone. He said, right. when we go to recruit airlines to come in to give us additional air service, we have the county, we have the city, we mm -hmm. have the chamber of commerce, and we all go collectively and as a team mm -hmm. and we make stuff happen and we don't, no one has to carry the load by themselves. Right. And, right, you know, Jim Shell also talked about that, you know, he, he was... Uh, going around to different cities, studying what makes Ben different, mm -hmm. different, better, worse than, than all these other similar sized towns. And he, his big takeaway is other towns are not collaborative like we are. Um, you know, he went to Boulder and 
The, he said that there's a hard line. The business world does not talk to the government. The government does not talk to the business world. And they just put up with each other and they're on parallel tracks operating in their own universes. And right. they're not coming together to solve affordable housing. They're not coming together to help plan for the future. And, you know, the, it's created a model where we have our affordable housing issues. But if you look at Boulder, I think the average price is eight or nine hundred thousand dollars. And it's a true drive in, you know, drive in city now where mm -hmm. anyone who has a service job doesn't even stand a chance of actually living there. Right. And that's what I'm hoping, you know, I'm optimistic about because the conversations that I'm hearing are all that this is not what we want our future to be. And it seems like we're on a track that I, I hopefully will be able to avoid, avoid that. And nothing's going to be perfect. Right. Obviously, we have homeless shelters and we have all kinds of issues here as well. Um, but the conversation's being had, right? You have to shine a light on it or you're, or you're yeah. not going to come up with the solutions. Well, and and it, that's where the paper, I think, can serve an important role. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's where we want to be at the table is to help shine a light, not to, you know, not to create angst for yeah. the community, but to be real yeah. and you know, be credible about what the future looks like and, you know, also talk about the, the successes though too. And I think this community does come together more than than others. And I think about another community that I hear Bend compared to, and that's Bozeman, sure. Montana. And I do have some familiarity with Bozeman because I was the publisher in Butte, and then we also had a shopper publication that was based out of Bozeman. And I don't see Bend and Bozeman as the same communities. Uh, I don't see the similarities other than they both attract a lot of tourists and they both have great skiing. I, yep. My son grew up skiing at Big Sky, but... Um, but, but it's because of the, of what you're talking about. I think Bend has a more, I guess I would call it fierce pride. Yes. And, and it's, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of difference, I think, between the, the communities. Bozeman is, is a, a university town with a, a university with a town around it. Correct. Yeah. And we are a town that has a university growing up in it. And, you know, just practically too, I think for, for Bend, one of the things that's good for our economy, it's kind of a duh, is the skiing is up at Mount Bachelor, but people have to come back here to stay over. I know? love that about this town. It, it is, at a, it's, and that's something that, Bozeman and yeah. all of these other, you know, kind of resort type communities that attract tourists don't have is that, you know, the main attraction, at least in the wintertime, yeah. is that mountain, which is fantastic, but you can't stay up there. You've got to come back here to sleep and yep. eat. And, you know, you've got your evenings and, yeah. and, and you've got your weekends that, you know, you've got your family members that maybe don't go skiing or go mountain biking or whatever activity you want to do on all that land that's out there around us that's fantastic to um, utilize but you know you've got to come back here or sun river yep. but, you know you've got a community that that people are going to experience that other places like bozeman they don't have to experience bozeman in order to experience bridger or big sky yeah. they can go be there and live in that world and then fly back out of Bozeman. So I think we've got a very unique opportunity here to be very attractive. And of course the Portland crowd is close enough yeah. that, you know, you, you don't ever want to try to be heading over here on a Friday night, Oops. which I've done a few times. And it's like, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. Um, and then try heading back on Sunday afternoon. Good luck. Yeah. You know, we're starting so. to see some traffic on those. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I think one of the main differentiators for Bend is how intentional it is. Mm -hmm. The town didn't grow up just because someone randomly, you know, the state said, oh, you have a university. Mm -hmm. You know, we fought long and hard to have the university come here. And not only did we find a place for it, we raised money to make it happen. Now all the local businesses are getting involved in helping build the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not by accident. And, and Ben didn't accidentally go from a sawmill town to what it is today. It was... 
a lot of smart minds dragging it into the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's perhaps what I'm most excited about. And, it, and Roger Lee kind of talked about the transition of the resort communities like Sun River and Pronghorn and all the Versada were created by the state to expose Central Oregon and expose these areas uh, to outsiders. And that's how they kind of first, that was their portal for discovery into these areas. Right. And then it, it went from tourism and then they use tourism to develop the job base that we are now have now. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to figure out what's our future. And that's why we're creating universities and health centers and, and mm -hmm. all that. Um, but it, it seems like a very different path than, you know, I have family and my, my sister is a veterinarian doctor in, in Bozeman and my brother lives in Big Sky and I have a, a, a heart, you know, I, I love that area. Um, mm -hmm. But when you go around those towns, there's, there's not a clear path forward. No. And, and I don't see the collaboration. I don't, the other thing I don't see that I see here when, when I look at a community and it's probably hard to define this, but you know, it's obviously that fierce pride in, yeah. you know, we're isolated. So, yeah. um, it's an, I bend is an isolated community that has its good points and it ba it's bad points. I think that's frustrating from a lot of standpoint of trying to be able to communicate to Salem and yep. to the Portland market, sure. Uh, which you know our company has a lot of experience with the rural side of Oregon. Now the whatever bend is yeah. the rural urban. We got to find a new word for yeah. it. But you know we're 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 an island. We're isolated. But that you know I've had I've heard some people say, well that's not a bad thing because yeah. we're very intentional. Yeah. Uh, but we have a fierce pride and and I think that is and we have a soul. I think that's the other thing that a lot of communities like Bozeman um, wouldn't be able to say yeah. that they have. They, they. I, I think about Butte, Montana, and I would say it has a, it has a soul. Yeah. It has a, it has more of a. Uh, they're not going to get. Uh, they're not going to stay down. You know, they, they get, they've gotten kicked a lot over the last. 150 years uh, that community has and have, have really caught very few breaks you yeah know, basically it was a rough and tumble mining community but by god you you uh you know people who are from butte yeah because they are proud yeah and they will they will defend their community and they will do whatever it takes to help butte grow yeah so when I was at the newspaper there, we put a bumper sticker together because the rest of the state was so fond of looking down their nose at us. Kind of like, you know, maybe Portland does a little bit looking down at, oh, it's like Klamath Falls where yeah. it was for 10 years. But we put a bumper sticker together in Butte that said Butte and proud of it. Yeah. It was sponsored by the newspaper. And it, it, that really spoke to what the soul of that community was. It was more of a kind of a back alley fighting Irish town yeah, yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> Bend isn't that, but Bend has a soul. And it uh, that's where I think we have one leg up over the other growth communities that you might compare us to, like Boulder and yeah. Bozeman. Yeah. It's, so a fierce pride and soul. I mm -hmm. love those. I had, I had never heard those attributed to Bend, but they make sense. Mm -hmm. I think we need a bumper sticker. <laughs> hey, <laughs> <We> just, <laughs> make that happen <laughs> um, but yeah that i i think that um really speaks to 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 where we're going and you know what i'm also trying to do with this this podcast is to help people understand what it means to be a bend citizen right that's and, what i was just thinking about too yeah. when when you just reflected that you know fierce pride in the soul and i thought i think that's part of the Part of the angst that's out there is yeah. that we don't want to lose that. Yeah. Um, How do we not but, lose that as we become a 150,000 person town? Yeah, because because we attract all these people here because we got them to come, you yep. know, the, the the grand plan to get them to come experience and yep. then, okay, come live here. Well, of course, people... They do. That's how they. That's how they end up here. They come and yep. experience it as a visitor and a and a tourist. And you know, all of that marketing worked really well to get them here. Now yep. they've come here. Okay. Now what do we do with them? Yep. Yeah. And what do we do with them when they're tourists here? I, yeah. You know, like Bill said, Bill Smith said, "Be nice." Yeah. You know, and then the bumper stickers, "Be nice." It's Bend. You know. Well, so. I love that philosophy of of the "be nice" 
bumper sticker as opposed to Ben sucks, don't move here, you know, tongue in cheek. Yeah. You know, it, well, it's tongue in cheek. It, it, I don't think it yeah. reflects the tone of the town. No. And, and, and that's where I think we're at a critical juncture where we need to remain optimistic. This mm-hmm. town was built on optimists and mm-hmm. people that were problem solvers. And right. I think we're at this critical joint w- junction where I'm afraid some of the new people in town are looking at it as a snapshot in, t- in time. They come here so. and th- they look at Pretty Bend that has all the parks in place, has all the schools in place, and they don't want to see change. They don't want an extra car behind them or in front of them at the roundabout. They don't want any change from here out. And I think we th- this gets to, to the heart of kind of what I'm trying to move forward in this discussion of change is inevitable. Mm-hmm. And, and we can't be afraid of it and we can't begrudge it because if we try to freeze Ben for what it is now, I'm afraid that we'll die. You know, there's, there's a lot of towns in, in, in Oregon that are beautiful and have natural resources and rivers and mountains and all the things that we have, but yet the economy's bad. You know, people have to leave to go find education. People have to leave to find jobs. Mm-hmm. And the towns and you've are- you've got your government and your business running on separate tracks. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and people are running for the hills. And, and, and I think that for us to take this for granted would be an absolute waste. You know, I think it would be a tragedy for us to take it for granted. And I think that it's somehow of, hey, be grateful for all that's been done. And if there's problems, be a proactive part of the, the mm-hmm. solution rather than putting a sarcastic bumper sticker on your 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 car and and um, getting mad every time from every time someone moves from California to here, you know, because you just moved from California two years. Sure. Ago. Yeah. But do you really do you think it's. Well, I didn't, but (laughs) but do you think it's those people who are saying, you know, stop, don't, don't move here? Yeah, it is. What I'm finding and and the people that have been here for generations are pretty appreciative for the growth. Um, The, the, the only divide that I I sense is kind of what you talked about, the agriculture community. I don't think they've had a voice, but, but when I meet people that are truly been citizens that have been here for two, three, four generations, unanimously, in my opinion, they are grateful for what's happened. They said there were times in the 70s and 80s and 90s when sawmills were shutting down and I was losing my family. My kids mm-hmm. were going to Portland for jobs or going out to state for, for, you know, to go to university and they never came back. Right. And I've made a good living. I was able to raise my family here. And now my grandchildren are coming here, you know, and, yeah. and, and what I'm finding is, is that the people that are, that have witnessed the full kind of evolutionary cycle of how to get here are appreciative. What I'm finding is, is that there's a couple year period where people come and enjoy it. And it's, it's, I don't know, it's yeah. like three to 10 years where they've been here just long enough, where they've seen change, where they've seen a little more traffic, they've seen a little bit more problems and they're saying time out, no more. Right. And I, and it, it's, and, you know, I come from a family development background, so I'm particularly attuned to it, but kind of the not in my backyard, the NIMBY mentality, um, that's what I'm, th- that's what I'm most afraid of. You know, mm-hmm. this town opened its doors to me. It opened its doors to you. Mm-hmm. And, and who are we to say that the door is shut? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. That's so, true. You know, I don't know. I, I, I'm just feeling, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent there, but I, I, but I, I think we're at a critical junction where we need to, you know, remain need, open to change, as scary as it is, right? Well, we need maybe to step back and, like you say, you've got the, you've got the folks who have been here forever, and they've seen, they see the broader picture yeah. because they, they had the experience, but the ones that have had a shorter experience. They don't know what's ahead of them. They yep. don't know what this is going to look like in, yep. in 20 years. So there is a lack of information and there's a lack of maybe vision of of how Bend is, you know, of their understanding of how Bend is going to grow deliberately yep. and trust. Yep. You know, I, I think it's it kind of, you, you talked about collaboration earlier, you know, as, as yeah. kind of summarizing my yammering about stuff you said well yeah that's collaboration well yeah it is it's collaboration and it's trust trust I mean, you've got to build the trust yeah and i you know what can we do to help build the trust 
with that those three to ten year uh, residents yep. that that can see that broader view, and I, I think that's where I applaud things like Ben twenty fifty, Ben twenty thirty. If if they can see that, okay, you you do have a plan. Yeah, this isn't just the urban sprawl of you know of all the other communities like you talked about with yep. land use. No, there is a there is a plan. Is it going to all work out? Probably not. Yep. But uh, will we get more roundabouts built? Which just annoyed the heck out of me my first few times coming <laughs> to Bend. It was like. <laughs> especially roundabouts where they changed the street name on yes. the other side of it. Yeah, well. It's like, seriously, but uh, <laughs> anyway, agree. God talk about going yeah. off on tangents. Yeah. And I got to say the drivers here are, you know, for as friendly as Bend is and everything, I got to say the drivers are not that friendly sometimes. Uh, and it, I, yeah, I've got more honking horns and middle fingers. I, and I don't drive slow. Oh <laughs> so man. That's, it's that's, just, uh, it's a really it's rough odd, to hear odd thing you know it, it, it's so counterintuitive what you would expect in bend because bend is a place people should be nice in and people generally are nice but i don't know there's some madness that happens maybe it's the air or something when they get behind the wheel oh yeah. that's such an off subject. yeah no but. no it, it's absolutely fine and you know and, and i feel it too and and it's so easy for me to say oh everybody get with the program you know but um, i see the challenges i i work with people that are trying to hire people for the you know the story you tell you yeah. you can't get people to move here mm -hmm. or i meet people that are struggling to buy a house and they can't buy it and, and mm -hmm. there's not enough rental housing and so i see those pain points i understand why mm -hmm. people are frustrated um but you know, unfortunately, there are a lot of towns in 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 Oregon that aren't growing, the, and mm -hmm. and it's no, frankly, no easier to live there. No, it and isn't. And so, you know, I think that the element of creating that trusted dialogue that that yeah. you're talking about with the bulletin, I think, is it's it's so critical in helping us continue to move forward without becoming partisan about about our our pretty little town here. <laughs> right. Or yeah, just so you know, focused on ourselves, we're not looking at what else is going on in the world. Yep. Right? So. Well, and I think that that's key uh, that we continue to we need to continue to try on other people's hats. Yep. You know, um, when you know there was a contingent of people in Broken Top that were fighting the location of Oregon State University, you have to understand their perspective. There, exactly. you know, a lot of them are retired. They they thought they were moving into a quiet West Side area. That, they were, and and, and they, they don't they changed. don't they don't want it to change. So yeah. I understand where they're coming from, from, but for the holistic plan for this town, you know, to have a university as part of it, I think is hypercritical and, and to have it in the heart of the town as opposed to on the edge so that you can integrate those students and professors and education and businesses all together. But it's not easy, right? No, it's not because it is going to change people's lives. And the, so for us as the newspaper for the community, the one thing we're charged with that I hope we do a darn good job at is information because yeah. when there's a lack of information, what fills that void? You know, yeah, the anger, the yeah. you know, not in my backyard. I don't understand why you need to do this. Yeah, you know, and and then then they they go off into their own echo chambers and just feed off of that. Well, yeah. you know, we're not going to solve as the newspaper. We're not going to solve all those problems. But if we can provide a trusted um, information yeah. source for people to read that you know we are going to look at both sides in the, of an issue and and we're not going to be promoting per se we're going to be reporting yep. and trying to find you know all sides of the issue that's what we can serve uh, to the community and i think that's what's going to help us survive and become sustainable well, business yep. you know the, the the newspaper itself if you followed the bankruptcy at all uh, wasn't in jeopardy. It wasn't in, you know, severe financial trouble um, outside of, you know, taking care of that building. Yeah. That, that <laughs> building. Um, the palace. Um, <laughs> the cost of that, I, 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 I don't like the, the um, image of it. You yeah. know, I, um, but it is what it yeah. is. But if you peel all of that away, which you peel all the debt that was associated with, trying to feed that yeah. monster of a palace. Yeah. The newspaper itself is 
financially sound. And, yeah. you know, I think we will be able to continue to serve the community, hire the journalists. Um, we have more journalists working for us um, and more folks um, helping our advertisers reach eyeballs than pretty much anybody else in the market. And so, you know, that's where our future is. And, you know, I, I hope we get to help facilitate those conversations for the community, such as, you know, some of the big issues that yeah. have recently been um, a part of the community conversation. Yeah. And the ones that are going to come. Well, hey, this the, the town is extremely grateful that you're here, that EO Media is, is doing what you're doing. I think the, you know, the, the plan that you have in place is is incredible. And I think um, with that, I'm sure you feel a lot of weight of of the community's vision on your shoulders. <laughs> but, you know, what's what's encouraging is is the towns behind you. Right. Yes. Even even in the acquisition of the bulletin. Um, didn't we have quite a few community leaders step up and say, hey, let's make this mm -hmm. happen. And they stepped in as investors. Yes, they did. Yeah. They, after we got past the point of in our inside of our company of can we, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, then, you know, should we? Yeah. You know, part of the can we is, you know, financially, it would have been uh, a lot more risk than we would have been willing to take yeah. uh, to finance this, you know, on our own. Yeah. And frankly, there were people from the community reaching out to us and saying, you know, as, as Bill Smith said to me, you know, what, what I wanted to try to figure out is who was going to ride this horse out of the swamp, you know? And so, yeah. he, you know, and he, they saw our company and they saw that, you know, we have been in business for 113 years now. Um, so we're fourth generation, family held. We know Oregon. Uh, this makes a lot of sense for us just as far as a footprint in Oregon and you know, we had community members who cared deeply about yeah. about this newspaper not going to Rhode Island Suburban Newspaper Group. Um, it would have changed the town. It would have changed. Um, I don't know if it would have changed the town necessarily. It would have changed the ability of the town to um, tell its story. Yeah, you to know, have an honest conversation. Yeah, right, because there would have been a lot less people available to hold those mirrors up, or, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, and to be able to, you know, frankly, have an advertising base. Yeah. It also would, would create a sustainable business model. It's, you know, you're, you're either going to evolve or you're going to retreat. You know, we are as a lot of newspaper companies are focusing much more on the digital platform. But what I, and this isn't anything we've started here, it was already in the works before we got here, was building a real full-blown digital agency that, you know, is a separate brand from the newspaper. You know, the, the people that are um, employed to do this are not going to come in and, and try to pitch you a, a banner ad on yeah. a website on top of the print ad. They're talking about true digital marketing. Yep. And with, I've started to work with them as recently. They're incredibly talented. Yeah, they are incredibly talented. And I, I've got to say a more talented crew than I've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, bar none, as far as, you know, I, we, we have a lot of interactions with agencies, of course, yep. um, digital agencies and yeah. all types, full service agencies as an industry, you know, yep. in partnerships and stuff. And I got to say what I'm seeing here is, you know, not just, um, you know, good salespeople, but good strategists. And yeah. also the other side of it is fulfillment. You know, so we do all the own, our own fulfillment for our campaigns. And so, you know, we don't outsource all of that. We're going to keep that all in-house, um, separately branded name. I, I love the fact that you're saying you're not outsourcing, you're fulfilling it here. And I, we I, are. I went met with your advertising department last week for some of my ads and you open those doors and there's a lot of people under your roof. There so, are. so whether I wanted to say tongue in chief call to palace, I think it was forward leaning and, and the amount of people that you're employing there, mm -hmm. you know, here in Bend is, is incredible. It, I hope the town listens to this because the clarity of vision that the bulletin has and the support that uh, the community came together to, to, to put it together with EO Media is, is incredible. And I, I definitely don't want to take that for granted. Oh, so we're so excited to be here. 
Well, I appreciate amazing. you for pushing this forward and don't let go of that print. I, uh, when my, my, and in full Ben style is my, my dog's a street dog, <laughs> was a street dog. But when my street dog runs out every morning and grabs the paper on the, on the, the driveway, it's part of me living here. So don't We've let the print a, go away. Oh no, I'm not in my lifetime, which I hope is somewhat long yeah. still. <laughs> so no, we won't let the print go away. But that's so funny because I've seen so many, or I've heard so many people say their dog comes and gets their paper in the morning. And oh, if yeah. it's not there, you know, they don't know what to do. Thanks for joining us. This is the Ben Beat. And until next time.